I just wanted to welcome everyone. Um, we are on our day three of our conference here and, and it's been going so well. Um, and we're so happy to have you. And this is the Frederick Firestein Empathic Ar Artist and Healer panel. And we are so thankful for Claudia and all your hard work on this, along with the other panelists. Uh, we have Emily Groschultz, David Katz, Molly Peacock, who will be here you know, shortly, and Frederick Turner. And we have our special guest, David Firestein. So happy to have you as well as your family that is with you today. Um, and I'm gonna introduce Claudia and then I'm gonna hand it right over. So Claudia is a three-time finalist for the Howard Nemirov Sonnet Award and the 2013 semifinalist for the Anthony Heck Award by Wayweiser Press. She is the author of Humor Me by David Robert Books in 2006 and of Richard Moore's Selected Poems and Essays forthcoming from Able Muse Press. She teaches workshops at the Writer Center, which you can find at writer.org, on the Villanelle, the Sonnet, Natural Meter, Poetry versus Trauma, and the Science of Poetry, currently via Zoom. Her chapbooks include Genetic Revisionism from 2019 and Bikini Buyer's Remorse from 2015. Her poems appear in journals and anthologies internationally. Claudia is also a health and science journalist, a visual artist, and a composer of art songs and tonal chamber music. Welcome. Thank you, Cindy. And welcome everyone. Thank you. And, and oh, Molly, I'm glad you've joined us. Um, thank you. Um, so um, poet, playwright, and psychoanalyst Frederick Firestein, who passed away at 80 in January of 2020. Uh, was a co-founder of the expansive movement in poetry along with Frederick Turner and the late Dick Allen. Um, Firestein's 1981 verse novel, Manhattan Carnival, still stands as an exemplary work of contemporary metrical narrative poems. In post 9-11 New York City, while continuing to see his, his patients for psychoanalysis, he wrote new narrative poems as well as essays on how writing poetry can, both, can help both to heal trauma and to prevent post-traumatic stress syndrome. In recent years, he made many of his works available online and elsewhere as well as in print. Um, some of friends, friends and colleagues will now uh, present a tribute to him in the form of his poems, their own memories and their reflections. Um, we're very happy to have with us also um, Fred's son, David Firestein, and I would like to welcome David first to say a few words. Welcome, David. Oh, thank you. Hey, Claudia, thanks. Hey, Molly, nice to see you, such yes. as it is virtually. Yes, great to see you too. Um, so I, I thought a lot about what to say. Um, mostly I just want to say thank you all for doing this. My dad would have loved it. Um, and he, he loved poetry, art, and I've been reflecting a lot over the course of this year, which you use the word trauma, Claudia. I think we're all going to be dealing with our collective trauma for some time and processing it and trying to figure it out. And um, my dad, I think of like three things when I think about him. One, his poetry. And he was always writing ever since I was a little kid, carried a book around. And that's where these narrative poems came from. They just kind of poured out of him in this, in this incredible way. And um, also his, his second, second career as a psychoanalyst where he helped people help heal them. Um, and hopefully he helped position a lot of his patients to better deal with what, what's going on today. Um, and then he was an amazing family man and an incredible father. Um, and the lessons that he taught me, I've reflected on a lot over the course of the year, um, have helped me to help myself, help my family, help my friends um, cope with everything going on and to find ways to find um, beauty in everything that's going on. Cause that's what my dad did. Yeah. No matter what was happening, he'd get knocked down, he'd fight through it and find some way to find the beauty in the blooming spring, which is going on right now, poetry he was reading. Um, I was looking around for one of my dad's books to read something. I, I picked a poem that I'll read in a second cause I picked one that, that wouldn't make me cry selectively. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get through it. Um, <laughs> And I found on my shelf, he had um, a bunch of Keats's poems. Um, 
and it was like it was tabbed open to what he had been reading and I started reading it which I just thought was like a very cool moment before before getting on this conference um and one of the memories that I wanted to share about my dad he, he told this great story um he had so many great stories about New York and he told this great story um, about when I was a kid and um what our neighborhood was like and he would always talk about uh, meeting people on the street doing stop and chats and um always had some extraordinary moments. Um, one of the extraordinary moments was um, he was walking down the street and there was a car crash and a cab had been hit by a car and somebody was trapped in the cab and everyone was standing around and he ran over to the cab, pulled the door open while the car was on fire and dragged the guy out of it. Um, and so I, I figured I'd start with that kind of cool heroic moment. Um, and he wrote a poem about it in Manhattan Carnival. So this, this poem is actually based on that true event that um, that happened in, in, in New York on our street growing up. Um, it's called The Crash. And it goes like this. I hear a crash and turn. A wall of flame surrounds a car. I'm hollering your name. The passerby first freeze and screaming run. The burning car is like a loaded gun. A doorman grabs my belt to hold me back. That woman, woman must be charcoal black. I shout the cab that hit her over there. The doorman pleads he doesn't have a prayer. I pry the door, he's married to the wheel. He doesn't look alive. I reach to feel his pulse. You nut, get out before it blows. The cabbie's life is ebbing from his nose. Exhaust pipes catching fire, hurry up. I pull him free and make my palm a cup to stop his bleeding. Someone hugs his feet. We lug him way past safety down the street. I'm suddenly in Lenox Hill berserk. Bellowing an intern, hurry jerk, a fire engine, siren tears the air, then hundreds more lunatics at their hair. The cabbie's face has dribbled into gray. I squirm from packs and handshakes, storm away. I won't look back as hoses, hoses douse the pyre. Remember how my greatest fear was fire. And if I was a hero, would you love me? At least, Marlene, you'd think much better of me. <laughs> and the fact that he tells that story and it's rhyming and it's 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 in classical poetry um and at the end there's that touch of humor um i just it 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 made me really kind of feel him today as i was reading it so i wanted to stop by sharing that one uh, yeah fasting yes um but claudia that was that was that was all i wanted to start with and i'd, I'd love to hear from you all thank you so much david that is beautiful so, uh, yeah, yeah, and it, it, it really um, brings out his immediacy. He was not just a poet. He was not just an observer. He was a real participant in life. Yeah. That is um, definitely true. Sorry? <laughs> that is definitely true, Claudia. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I'd like to introduce next Frederick Turner, who um, has been a lifelong, well, a long time friend of Fred Feierstein. And um, Fred Turner um, is author of uh, many books of both uh, poetry and essays. Um, his, uh, he was born in Northamptonshire, England. And uh, after spending several years in Central Africa where his parents were anthropologists, um, Turner, Dr. Turner was ed educated at University of Oxford and um, became a naturalized uni U.S. citizen in 1977. Um, he, is pr he recently retired as Founders Professor of Arts and Humanities at the University of Texas at Dallas, um, having held academic positions at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, Kenyon College. Uh, from 1978 to 82, he was editor of the Kenyan Review, which um, I, I believe was an opportunity for him to uh, discover and meet many great poets um, like himself. He has uh, um, been married to, uh, since 1966 to Maylin Turner and has two sons. Um, and I just want to, um, I, I, I'm trying to keep this short. There's a lot more to say that I'd like to introduce and welcome Fred Turner. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Claudia. And it's so good to see these fine faces here. Um, I'm moved. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to begin uh, with a poem 
that I wrote for Fred uh, probably only about two or three months before he passed. And <coughs> he, um, <coughs> I think he liked it. So um, it takes a couple of little, little uh, prods of him as between old friends. Portrait of a man. My friend Fred Firestein doesn't lack for nerve. Six times he's faced death one way or another. Stark horrors weathered with a kind of verve. Drunk yet on poetry, my Jewish brother. Doing the Lindy with his IC nurse. Shooting a basket with an aneurysm. Writing his headlong incorrigible verse. He is a man, a fine anachronism. He is the world's most sentimental lover, an addict quite besotted with his wife, able somehow to always rediscover that mystery he's worshipped all his life, a man in honor and unthinking pride, a mad and indefatigable talker, a healer always on the patient's side, a kvetcher and a generous New Yorker. To power, he's his own worst enemy, neglects the means and ravens for the ends. He's never learned the arts of flattery, distrusts the world and overtrusts his friends. And in this man, there is an innocence for all his overt cynicism still. God give me too that fine insouciance, that man's who is so very hard to kill. And so his chess game with the patient reaper becomes an easy old familiarity. To see him play makes everything get deeper. I cannot say how much he means to me. Um, <clears throat> I, want to say a few, I want to say a few things about, um, about Fred. Um, uh, to try to sum up very briefly, some of the big themes that he dealt with, some of the, you know, the, the, the material that he, was, that he was working with in his poetic life. Of course, maybe the, the major thing that he, he dealt with was essentially his defiance of death. Um, his defiance of death, physical, yes, but also psychological and spiritual in his work as a poet and as, a, uh, as an analyst, he was fighting death. Um, I, wanted, I want to mention the fact that, uh, the, you know, what I always felt with Fred was that <clears throat> he was always coming back from some terrifying exploration of the darkest human realms. I mean, he, he sort of adventures in the psychological underworld. Um, he, he, he's dealing with, it's very hard to sympathize with narcissists and, and Fred had to deal with narcissists and he had to deal with people who were showing him you know, the darkest side of, 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 of humanity. Um, but he was always sympathetic and he was never revulsed by it. He, he, you know, he, 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 he hung in there with people. Um, it, he reminds me in some ways <clears throat> of the character Joseph in the, in the book of Genesis. Um, he has that Joseph-like power of interpreting dreams. Um, his work on dreams, that is particularly in terms of the way in which we have to make stories of our lives. And we make sense of our lives by making stories and dreams are, are part of that work. Um, uh, he, he's Joseph-like as also as a kind of exile and as a reconciler. Uh, I think that's the, the, there's a sort of analogy there. Um, his organic recognition of the bodily power of meter and rhyme. Uh, he was particularly devoted to Yeats. Poetry is for him as physical as sculpture, as musical as music. Um, 
his dramatistic imagination. Uh, he, his poetry is always a conversation, both in therapy and in poetry. Um, theater was his uh, faithless lover, <laughs> where poetry was his native land. Um, his love of New York, uh, has any American city ever been loved so much? Uh, maybe London and Paris were loved, you know, similarly by some of the great European poets, but, you know, um, uh, he, he loved his New York. Um, his unfailing and generous well of nostalgia. He was a great, a great uh, practitioner of the, uh, of the, the tradition of Ubi Sunt, where have they gone? Where have they, where have they gone? And that is also a piety, a, a kind of holy piety to the past. Um, his recognition of the eternal threat to him and his loved ones on account of being, being Jewish and his amazing lack of resentment, which can destroy a poetic gift. Um, and Fred as the eternal lover. Fred and Linda are for me iconic. They, 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 these are, these are the, for me, something about you know, the classic American lovers. And it moves me when, every time I think about it. His sense of humor, that wonderful mixture of his, of irony and compassion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He, he suffered it and he laughed at it at the same time. Uh, I'd like to read just one poem of his from his New and Selected, um, the poet to his younger self. Let me find that. <clears throat> the poet to his younger self. So there you are, 20, hands on your hips, squinting at the sun. Dressed in a white shirt and purple cashmere sweater, you sniff the spring air for death, merely to write a poem about it. Your wife-to-be takes your hand. You stroll into the woods, a mythological creature, half man, half woman, dappled under the leaves, like the checkered tablecloth you spread, nothing to trouble you but the bees. You read Keats to her. She hears nothing but your voice. You read well. You say you're innocent and must suffer to write well, but don't know what that means. Don't know what the Ubisunt theme is. Don't know the Ubisunt theme is serious. You are so serious. She tickles you plays hide and, hide and go seek in the trees, counting to 50. You think of me thinking of you. Imagine that I mourn the past and want to sing of it. I mourn nothing, not myself, not the real deaths of friends. Play children unnoticed under the leaves. Thank you, Thank you Fred. That was beautiful, Fred. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to introduce um, Molly Peacock, whom many of you already know, uh, since she is the uh, wonderful keynote of this conference. Um, and uh, Molly also has been a long, long time friend of, of Fred Firestein. Um, Molly, Molly Peacock is the author of seven books of poetry, including The Analyst, The Second Blush, and Cornucopia, New and Selected Poems. She's also the author of several books of prose and a memoir, Paradise, Piece by Piece. Her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, The Nation, The New Republic, The Paris Review, and other leading literary journals. Among her honors are fellowships from the Danforth, Ingram Merrill, and Woodrow Wilson Foundations, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. In Canada, she has been the series editor for the best Canadian poetry in English, 
and the poetry editor of the Literary Review of Canada. Thank you for, for being here, Molly. Oh, thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, it's wonderful to it's wonderful to be here. And I just want to say a special hello to David and to Linda. Hello, Linda. Um, Hi, Molly. So uh, glad to see you. Hi, Molly. So uh, glad. Yes, it's 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 wonderful to see you. And I, I just wanted to say, um, uh, actually, uh, I've I in fact am just meeting for the first time, David, your wife. So hello to you too. <laughs> um, uh, Fred was a poet and a healer, um, and we had many conversations about the intersection of poetry and healing, but I want to make it clear that Fred was not a poetry, a poetry therapist. Uh, um, there, there is this whole genre of poetry therapy, but Fred was a psychoanalyst and he used poetry in his psychoanalytic practice, as he told, as, as he would describe it to me and as he wrote about it, as a way to seek um, uh, alternate functions of metaphor. He understood how metaphors worked in poetry and he would listen for the central metaphors of his patients' lives. And uh, as, as someone who had, had been in a long analysis myself, uh, Fred and I had a lot of conversations about this kind of thing. And what he understood was that if you change a metaphor in a poem, you change the course of, a po of the poem. And if you can encourage or allow or create an environment in which a patient can change uh, uh, their metaphor, then that leads to healing. And, uh, and just that simple sense of metaphor, of saying, uh, and actually I think it's a sense of simile, of saying what something is like. It felt like this. And that going back and forth um, allows a, a powerful sort of progress in a life and a powerful growth. And uh, as, as I said, Fred wrote about this and in one essay that's quite available, um, it's an essay called Trauma and Poetry, a psychoanalyst view of the healing power of the arts. He tells the story again, Fred, ha Fred has two incidents uh, uh, from his childhood that he recalls one of them is a pre-verbal moment. And I personally always think of poetry as connected to the pre-verbal. I know it, it's, it's this endless effort to verbalize what's ineffable. And uh, Fred's story was of uh, having a, uh, an ear infection when he was two years old. And it being extremely painful, and and they, this is when doctors came to your house, and this and, uh, this abscess had to be drained, and it was ex and and so here's this tiny child in pain, and how he soothes himself is he starts counting on his fingers, and he's pressing into his hand, and sort of creating pain in order to control pain. And in that, it, it's, that's a microcosm of, of that's a, the seed of a poem. And he felt that, that that pressing those 10 syllables, those 10 fingers, pressing each finger, that 10 was, was, was a, um, the, the inside of the secret to the poet's iambic pentameter. And the, his connection to childhood, which was always available to him, was also a great source for his poetry. And another, another uh, um, this uh, uh, thing that I recall is that he witnessed his mother fall uh, uh, when he was three years old. And that too became this powerful, powerful uh, memory of witness. And later on in life, after 9-11, as the towers fell, 
felt there, there was this sense uh, in Fred's work of a recognition of what happens when something topples. Uh, so I, um, uh, I, I just wanted to share those instances with you because so much of poetry seems to be, poetry seems to be talked about in the land of the adult. Um, but Fred always was able to bring poetry back to the sources of our childhood, because it, it is those sources, I think, that, uh, that drive our poems, and, and certainly Fred believed that. And, and he also believed that, that, that somehow these unconscious connections uh, were the sources of meter and certainly the sources of rhyme. And as people uh, uh, reconnect events of their lives in therapy, those events start to rhyme. And so uh, there, was, there was a constant, constant feeding back and forth between therapy and poetry for Fred and in his aesthetic altogether. Uh, uh, he, um, uh, you know, when he was younger, uh, wrote, uh, uh, a book of poems called Manhattan Carnival, and then after 9-11 wrote a book called Dark Carnival. And I'm just going to quote, I'm just going to read two little sections from a poem called The Other Half. I'm going to read something in the beginning and something in the end. And it's about uh, the room that he writes in, which is the therapy room and also this place of creativity. The room I write in is quiet as old age. Rage dying, hope dying, despair dying. I write by hand, slantwise on the page. Sometimes closing my eyes and in pain, sighing. The carpet is a calming green and gold. The couch L-shaped is Berkshire's autumn brown. And he it starts cataloging the things in the room and gets to a telephone. Turn left, a stark white telephone where patients call in terrors from within. Beside it is a radio whose news of terror now gives in to simple blues. Above it is a vial of clonopin. Below it is a drawer with Cipro masks, tuna fish cans, M&Ms, red, white, and blue. My will, my passport, and my father's flask for football whiskey. What gifts have you? I write and doze and write and doze again until the dawn blooms a purplish pink. I shave and shake my stubble in the sink. This book will take till I am 64. Three years from now, where will you be then? I lie back on the couch, pick up my pen. Here's to Fred. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Lovely, lovely tribute. So, well, next I'd like to introduce David M. Katz. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so, um, David M. Katz, who apparently met Fred relatively recently and became good friends. Um, um, David Katz is an award, award winning financial journalist as well as a poet. Um, he was born on New York's Lower East Side and has lived most of his life in Manhattan, like Fred. Um, David Katz is the author of four books of poetry, In Praise of Manhattan, 2020, uh, Stanzas on Oz from 2015, and Claims of Home from 2011, all published by Dos Madres Press, and The Warrior in the Forest, published by House of Keys Press in 1982. Um, and in June 2020, uh, David launched the David M. Katz poetry blog, um, 
which uh, is a website blog containing frequent commentary on poets and poetry, quite worthwhile. Um, DavidMCatsPoet.com. Um, so with no further ado, I'd like to welcome David Katz. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much, Claudia. Um, unlike uh, the rest of uh, uh, Fred's wonderful companions, my um, interaction with him was very brief, but I'd like to think of it that it made up with in quality what it lacked in quantity uh, of years. And uh, it was a, a poet's relationship, which um, I like to think uh, spreads beyond time in a certain kind of way. Um, before I begin uh, my brief remarks, I, I'd like to read a villanelle I wrote a few months after uh, Fred died. It's called Little Elegy for FF, and it has an epigraph from William Blake. <clears throat> Little Elegy for FF, Exuberance is Beauty, Blake. Begin again. Who is to say we can't? Friends die, knees fail, Manhattan's lost its way, but Fred Firestein remains exuberant. Sometimes irascible, the man could rant against the foibles of the current day. Begin again, who is to say we can't, even if the streets fail to enchant as they once did. Their glamour fades away. But note that Fred stays as exuberant within his lines as anyone would want, alive enough to have his streetwise say. Begin again, who is to say I can't revive his east side cadence in a scant elegy? The body will decay, but a voice like that remains exuberant. It speaks directly with a Yiddish slant, an obscene wit in Chaucerian array. Begin again, who is to say we can't? Not Fred Firestein, who stays exuberant. Um, and uh, again, thank you, Claudia, for originating this idea of a tribute to Fred. Uh, after his sudden death on January 18th, 2020, um, so long uh, and so short a time ago, and for spearheading the effort uh, through our play gear. Uh, your motivation may have been similar to mine uh, when I heard of Dick Allen's death on December 26th, 2017. These two formidable poets and their deaths are linked in my mind as they were linked in death, in life, sorry. I met Dick Allen uh, at a holiday party uh, on December 17, 2017. In my 15 minutes or so with him, I found that although Dick was my senior by a decade, we'd been similarly affected by the late 1960s and had gone on to embrace the uses of traditional form without dispensing with those of free verse. In the flurry of emails that flowed between us, I came to feel as Rick Blaine felt about Captain Renault and Casablanca, that this might be the beginning of a beautiful friendship. But nine days uh, later, Dick Allen died. In an attempt to navigate the absence, I began assembling a tribute to Alan's work uh, scheduled for April 2018 at Sweet Bar in New York. As I was searching for potential participants, all vectors pointed to Fred. Dana Joya, for instance, wrote back, you must ask Fred Firestein. At first, I encountered the irascible side of Fred's nature and his answer to my invitation. Tell me who you are, please, and how you were connected to Dick, who I am mourning, Fred wrote in his email. 
whenever I, I, I pass the Shaking Crab, which was one of his favorite restaurants on Upper Broadway, I think fondly of this side of them, the Shaking Crab. Uh, but when the time came for the reading, Fred was there in body and especially in soul. At first, he spoke of how he and Dick and Fred Turner came together to form the expansive poetry movement. Coming from different backgrounds, they were united by their passion to expand the resources of poetry beyond the free verse they were then writing to include traditional narrative and form. Another objective was to focus less on the self and more on the world outside it. During the event, Fred read from a kind of uh, manifesto for the movement uh, that Dick uh, published uh, in, in, the in the magazine that Alan uh, edited called Cross Currents. And Fred also read two of Alan's poems. Overcome with sadness, Fred stopped in the middle of reading the second one, Alan's immensely moving poem, The Afterlife. I can't go on, he said, putting down the book. Read it. In the ensuing two years, Fred and I developed a frequent and affectionate correspondence and found that we had a lot in common, even though he was eight years older than I am. We were Lanzmann, after all, both of us New York Jewish poets who spent our childhoods about eight blocks from each other on Manhattan's Lower East Side. <clears throat> Although I didn't think so initially, we had strong poetic affinities. How did you get to write like me? Fred demanded in an email as he was reading my book, Stanzas on Oz. How did you know I keep writing that Oz is our central myth? Indeed, I came to realize that the title of my most recent book, In Praise of Manhattan, probably owes something to that of Fred's most well-known volume of poetry, Manhattan Carnival. You want to write a long poem? He wrote me in an answer to a question I hadn't really asked. People seem to like Manhattan Carnival the best. I wrote it at 32 after translating Chaucer. First excerpted in the autumn 1980 issue of the Kenyan Review, which was then edited by Fred Turner, Manhattan Carnival, a dramatic monologue, was published in 1981 by Countryman. Although one of his later books is called Dark Energy, Manhattan Carnival is a burst of bright energy, replicating the dynamism of our borough in the late 1960s and early 1970s. In one of his uh, emails, Fred wrote that couplets are a driven form. Uh, he, sa he said, and he bold faced the word driven. And Fred's Chaucerian couplets, to be distinguished from, say, the stately balance of Alexander Pope's, drive the reader down the page and through the streets of Manhattan recording the dazzling marijuana-enhanced sensual display on offer during those times. For example, my eye is like a child's, the smog is pot, shining cratefuls of plum, peach, apricot are flung out of the fruit man's tiny store behind the supermarket glass next door. Landslides of grapefruit, orange, tangerine, persimmon, poisonberry, nectarine. The florist tilts his giant crayon box of yellow roses, daffodils, and flux. Also driving the action of this 36 page poem, actually a group of 21 discrete poems is the hidden complexity of its structure. On one level, as its subtitle says, it's a dramatic monologue, conveying the turbulent inner workings of the mind of its protagonist, Mark Stern, as he dashes through the streets in a quest to reconnect with Marlene, 
his former wife of 10 years. In passing, the sights and sounds of the city reflect the wild energy of Mark's desire, as in these lines from The Windows, which is one of the poems in the Hatton Carnival. I need the windows of the tourist boards on Fifth, their beaches, lower Alps, and fjords, the students playing clarinet duets, the mime in top silk hat and epaulets, the Hare Krishnas spreading incense, joy, their flowing peach robes, shoes of corduroy, the blind man singing hymns, St. Thomas Church, the scaffolding where whistling workmen perch, the haughty English manager, manager of cooks, St. Patrick's nave, Rizzoli's picture books, Tiffany's clock, the pools of Stuban glass, the pocket park with cobblestones for grass. As I as I read this, I have I, I had to take note of this amazingly mu musical line, the scaffolding where whistling workmen perch. You can really feel the wind up there, frighteningly. Um, besides uh, dramatic uh, monologue, Manhattan Carnival has a firm narrative structure and features the close observation of the outside world that the expansive poetry movement later espoused. Indeed, Mark Stern's flood of thoughts is in response to his encounters with a bevy of characters. A woman he picks up in a bar, a blind man orating on a crowded bus. Quote, three bankers with the same suit, haircut, face, end quote. A, a costume cowgirl selling papaya juice and many others. But as the years rolled on, Fred observed a different Manhattan with different eyes, a more somber, less colorful island that nevertheless could elicit, elicit an old tune from the poet's lips. I'd like to end with a sonnet that again alludes to Casablanca. It's from Fred's 10th book, Time's Refugee, and it's as much a love letter to Manhattan in what he considered its golden age as it is a lullaby for a lover. As time goes by, that was a golden age in which we lived. Each day was summer. God was everywhere in every molecule of New York City air when we were young and just believed in us. That was a hallowed age in which we lived. Late 20th summer, love was everywhere. I'd stop beside you on our walks to stare at you, buying a peach, climbing a bus's stair. And there were buts, but always and, and, and sitting in central, doodling each other's hand. And I recite poems, my simple fictions, in meter, rhyme, and New York City diction. As dusk drew near, we'd hold a darkening kiss. When you are distressed, you must remember this. And we remember you, Fred. Thank you, David. That was Thank you. Beautiful. Lovely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Beautiful tribute. Thank you, David. My dad actually read that at um, when when Aaron and I got married in Mexico about 15 years ago. Um, oh, how beautiful! Sorry, 10 years ago. Uh, we've been together for 15 years. Um, so you must remember this. We do. <laughs> we do very very well, and I, I we, we have that framed in our apartment. So David is a great poem. Thank we. You. Wow. Well, thank you. Next, um, I'm going to introduce Emily Grosshuls, although um, her, her essay is going to be read by Fred Turner, um, since Emily has a sore throat. But um, Emily 
Gross Holes is a, a, I'm sorry, um, is a professor of philosophy at um, Penn State University and a prolific writer um, on many subjects. Her, her thesis was on four master tropes in poetry and mathematics, which um, I noticed because I actually took, I took part in a seminar she gave at Westchester a few years ago on poetry and mathematics, uh, at which Fred Turner was also present. So that was a nice kind of reunion too. Um, and um, she's a prolific writer, but uh, I'll just mention her recent poetry books, um, the, Stars of the, the Stars of Earth, New and Selected Poems from Abel Muse Press in 2017. Um, another, uh, <clears throat> another of her poetry books that I, I really enjoy is called Propos Proportions of the Heart, Poems that Play with Mathematics. Uh, so I would like to introduce Emily and Maya Fred Turner. Please unmute. Fred, un unmute, please. There, thank you. When you begin to read Frederick Feierstein's book of poetry entitled Fathering, published in 1982, you think the poems are going to be about the arrival of his son, David. In part one, Heliotropes, the first poem is titled Travelers, where he writes, Summer, Linda is in her ninth month, and the earth is greener and more abundant with orange and blue wild flowers, cornfields, and cattle than I've ever seen her. Touching his wife, he feels the baby thump, and so the poem ends, this planet is alive everywhere. In the second poem, he's there in his crib, and his presence turns into silent music, birdsong and Chrysler on the, on the violin in quartet. He arcs his arms after nursing, Outside the blue jay stands a 16th note on a clothesline. I pray, I play Chrysler's Sicilienne for them on the violin with the mute on. And the third poem at the window is full of geometry. The New York street outside the window is a line polished for Saturday night, which baby David blinked at. And then I kiss his head it's a crystal ball. And the poet reminds us that the first months of a baby's life can change one's sense of time in the poem Timeless. Nightfall again. In the endless night of David's first month, he and his mother, asleep in their rocker, are a Madonna and child. The next poem is Nursing where the poet ends by the analogy that he nurses poems, capturing how his wife nurses, his, nurses the baby. And the final poem in the section is Dancing. 2 a.m., David can't sleep. So Linda turns to a jazz station on the radio, leans David against her thighs, plants his sun hat on her head and moves his arms like a flapper's that way they'll dance until dawn. However, the title of part two is Sitting Shiva. That is the week long mourning period in the Jewish tradition. The first poem in that section is titled Hospital. And the poet is there with David in his lap, in, in, his, la in his lap. He is caring for his own father, too weak to ring for help. He is about to fly away touch him in his bed, and he touches my face, his fingers already feathers. In the next poem, Rain, his mother mourns, and in the next, Sleepy Time Boy, he mourns and cannot even carry his son, handing him to his wife because of grief. And the following poem is entitled Kaddish, prayers that praise God and are also used recited by relatives during the period of mourning. Everyone is displaced. Linda sleeps in my mother's bed, holding her hand, 
David sleeps uncomfortably in his carriage, and I sleep in my old bed in the den among my father's treasures, photos of us, David at my head. So it seems that this book is not just about being a father, but also about what it is like to be fathered and to lose a father just after the crucial moment when the poet could offer a grandson as well as books of poetry. The next section, part three, is entitled Coming Home, where everything is slightly, subtly changed. In the poem, A Message, the poet hopes to find an old message from his father on the telephone to hear his voice again, but there is nothing there, only silence. And then the next poem, For David, in the middle of the 21st century, carries us decades ahead to a time when the poet is gone and his son might remember him in a poem. David, when you are bald, though I hope you're not, as you are now and rocking in a hammock, Remembering something that has no words, pick up this poem that has your father in it. I've just come back home from traveling. I shake out my umbrella. I lift you from the darkness and rock you like a pendulum. You tug at my shirt, fascinated by the blue and purple rectangles. So I take it off. You stuff it in your mouth as you will, my virtues and my faults. The sun blazes and holds us like a photo in the moment as you hold this as I once held you, David. The temporal organization of this poem is very complex. When the sun blazes, is David a baby delighted that his father is back home? Or is he a bald old man looking at a photo of his father and remembering? What is the holding that brings father and son together? Is it an embrace or the poem itself? In trio, the poet listens to a string trio while the baby David beats time on my arm with an oatmeal, co with oat, oat, with an oatmeal cookie. And he strokes the back of his head with my father's fingers. The trio is grandfather, father and son. In foxtrots, his father and mother danced together, brought back by the music, almost immortal. But then he disappears and she exits. In At the Phonograph, the baby listens to music the old-fashioned way. And recall that this book was published in 1982, a song about love and death. Somehow he looks like both of his grand grandfathers. I turn him step after step to the phonograph. When he gets there, the record ends, the needle searching the groove. Part four, separating is about loss and letting go. The dire and ironically titled poem, Thanksgiving, lists the losses that occurred altogether in half a year, his father and aunt and uncle and even a cousin to suicide, while his sister developed leukemia and his mother has cracked up. His mother's troubles are recorded in the poem, Unveiling. My mother stands in the rain, too depressed to move, staring straight ahead at the unchiseled monument of her own grave. I run to her with an umbrella made of my son, made of my own childhood, but I can't reach her. But in the last section, part five, learning to walk, the child helps the father move towards re reconciliation with his father, with his father. The metaphor of learning to walk, which is an astonishing moment in the life of a baby, is developed across these last poems. The poem in the park begins with his son embarking on a first trial of independence as he slips from my shoulders to a circle of children lurching in the grass. And this reminds him of how anxious his own parents were, first when they sent him to school on his own, and later when he came home late at night as a teenager. Why? Because they were both children of the pogroms, overreacting and still haunted by the memory of the Cossack. In Walk, 
he tells himself, get up and walk. And in Travelers, his son goes with him. David, riding on my shoulders, we hike through the woods, naming pine trees and boulders, outcroppings of silver cactus, pink and yellow wildflowers, mindlessly kicking dust. It is the ninth month of your death. And the book ends with small steps. Here again, Fred Feierstein shows how his son integrates nature and the transcendent, a church and birds, shadows and autumn leaves, helping his father to take small steps and arrive somewhere despite the fall. Holding David's hands, I take small steps across the, the courtyard, sh shows of fall leaves rolling off me. He wants to reach the relief of the church door. Wrens have built their nests in the hair of the saints. So he leads his father to a relief, to relief, and a place to nest. Who is fathering who? He lifts his little boy on his shoulders, plays music for him, and shows him the colors of wildflowers. And in return, his child helps him retrieve his own parents in all their complexity as a blessing. Thank you, Emily. Emily, that was beautiful. Oh, Emily, thank you. Yes, great, wonderful tribute. And thank you, friend. Oh, well, um, I guess it's my turn. Uh, I, I just have a few things to say. First of all, this is such a gift to be here with all of you. And uh, I feel such love um, coming from everyone. And it, it would be fair to say that um, it's thanks to Fred Firestein that I actually am connected with all of you. Um, um, I met Fred in, I think it was 91, 1991 or 92, um, thanks to Dana Joya, to whom I had written a letter uh, asking if he could put me in touch with others who were promoting expansive poetry in the sense that, that um, well, I didn't know that term at the time, but uh, the idea of um, the poetry that, that uh, Fred and um, Dick Davis and Fred Turner and, and others have, uh, have put forward. So, um, and uh, Dana wrote back and uh, one of the people he named uh, prominently was Fred Firestein. He said, well, Fred knows everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that was true. And since I live near Washington DC, um, much of, uh, my friendship with Fred was, you know, in, consisted of telephone calls. Um, and uh, I think I may have only seen him in person maybe half a dozen times over the years, um, but they were memorable. And there was one reading that, uh, that Fred Firestein organized uh, at Barnes and Noble in New York. And um, Turn Fred Turner was there too. And uh, that was a wonderful uh, highlight. Um, for, for all of us, um, that was in also in the 1990s, mid 1990s. So, um, so just um, reflecting on the fact that uh, that uh, phone conversations um, had so much to do with it, and also um, what Fred Turner has said about um, Fred Firestein's conflict between drama and poetry, and how drama was kind of his uh, what did you say unfaithful. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I, I had this, um, this sonnet that I wrote um, as a tribute to Fred Firestein. Um, it's called The Conversation. I dream I'm on the telephone with Fred, a landline, and I'm buried in the land. He's sitting in his office, pen in hand, Manhattan's silhouetted skyline spread behind him says he's writing poems instead of all the dramas, essays he had planned. Is that a problem? I don't understand, I'm scolding him. Oh wait, he's in my head. It was a trade. I'd give him one more day. He'd give me one more angsty conversation about how short life is and how his play will be produced, though in a different nation and city 
how I miss him now. It seems his carnival keeps winding through my dreams. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Claudia, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was really beautiful, Claudia. Yeah. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, David. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, we, I think we have some time for questions. This has flown by. Claudia, I just want to say I have to jump out, but I, I wrote in the chat. I just want to thank the panelists and uh, thank you for organizing this lovely panel. And it was wonderful to have Fred Firestein's family here um, in celebration of his life and um, Frederick Turner, David Katz, Emily, Rosehold, Molly. Am I missing anyone? Um, who are the rest of the panelists? Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cherise and, and Cindy. Therese. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. You. Are there are there any questions? I think we have a few minutes. Anyone want to bring up another memory? I'll, I'll, I'll say something maybe to, to, to kind of close us out, Claudia, if if we're winding down here. Um, uh, there have been uh, <clears throat> there have been a number of times over the course of the last year where I could swear my dad is here <laughs> like i can almost see him in one of the tiles on the zoom just like joining us <laughs> and laughing so thanks. right yes yes thank you it's true i i think uh it happens to me too <laughs> <laughs> he would love this he would he love was, this he was wonderful friend and inspiration and yeah. uh really um did a lot for the arts and for what all of us love in the arts. Well, he felt very passionately about it and very passionately about all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Fred, please. Thank you. So, uh, well, I hope we will all stay in touch. Um, and, uh, well, uh, we can... I, yeah. I was just gonna say, Fred, I, I just, I accidentally talked over you the, the awkwardness of Zoom, but I, I will say, and then Fred, please jump in. Um, I'll email everyone whose email address I have from the Zoom. Um, so you all have my phone number and our contact information. And um, when you're in New York, in the city that my dad loved, look us up. We'll have a drink. And thank you, Linda, for being here too. Yeah, it's really you, great Linda. to see you. It's so good to see you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And, and, and good to meet you, Aaron. <laughs> thank you. Thank you okay. very much. And thank you, thank you, Claudia, again for organizing this. Thank you, Molly. And, and for persisting. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. See you again. Yes.